I know some of you get that. It's 60 seconds long. It's called Every Word. It's a video devotional, a verse of the Bible applied to be a blessing in your life today. There's much I can tell you, but I want to uh, uh, respect the clock, and so I won't talk too much about any of this. Uh, but we've seen people really blessed by this. Folks get it, and then they post it on Facebook. And now all your Facebook friends get to see it, and they get to watch a 60-second devotional about God's love or grace or the Sabbath or the resurrection or hope or whatever it might be. It's, it's meaningful stuff, a minute long. And what we, we were in the bank. First, my wife was in the bank. And she gave an every word card, not an every word car, an every word card to the man in the bank. My wife and I were back a week later. He pulled us aside. He said, I really want to thank you because I've been watching that devotional every day. Here's what he said. It's changing me. I said, praise the Lord. And not just that, because being as it's at the It Is Written website, there's all kinds of resources there. He's going to plug in, do some Bible studies, watch some programs. God will lead him to a church. Praise the Lord. Lady turned up not long ago in a little teeny tiny church in Missouri. They said, how did you know about us? I've been watching It Is Written. It says in the credits, Seventh-day Adventist. So I went to your website, found the location of the church. That's why I'm here. Our media ministries are impacting people to know Jesus. So get a hold of every word. E a lady in a nursing home told me, I email it every day to every one of my contacts. God bless her. And we have thousands. By the way, I mentioned Facebook. Follow us on Facebook so you know what we're doing. We've got tens of thousands of people who do. Later on this year, we have Revelation today coming from Charlotte, North Carolina. Your church may wish to do it. If not, you can do it at home. It's going to be on satellite and it's going to be on the internet on a, on a real good connection. So check out this full-length evangelistic series, life-changing. We'll have people joining us from around the world. We're seeing exciting things happen like that globally it's 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 fun to be doing what we're doing and see god uh doing what he's doing so I, I didn't make notes of what i wanted to tell you about but i wanted to tell you about the car which turned into a card i wanted to tell you about every word revelation today and the television programs which we're having a great deal of fun with what we most want to do is get into the bible and so knowing we have uh time enough let's take the time we need to do that today i just want to in the presence of you all thank very much the administration and the staff of the gulf states conference for allowing me the privilege of being here this weekend this is a blessing i'm here with my son jacob and uh, we love it here i must tell you now you can tell from my accent that i'm from the south you can tell that uh you all think you have a southern accent this is a genuine a genuine southern accent I'm from New Zealand, and if you look at a globe or a map of the world, that's about as far south as you can get. So this is a southern accent. Now, I also live in the south right now. I live in the south of California, southern California. But my wife is a Tar Heel, and we for years lived in North Carolina. My children were born in North Carolina, and we passed it in Kentucky. So we love the south. You know, there's a lot to like about southern California. You gotta like the weather. Oh man, the weather is. We have two seasons out there, good and better. That's all. <laughs> Humidity? Nah, -uh. we don't even bother with that. There is a sign on the border of California. It's certainly on the Oregon border. No humidity allowed. That's what the sign says. So the humidity just keeps out. It's fantastic. And, and we live near the beach. Oh, it's great. You live kind of near the beach here too, but we live near the beach. Our nearest beach is Malibu. I live in a house on a cliff. Uh, Bruce Willis is my neighbor on one side. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay, but the weather is good. Weather is good. But I want to tell you how wonderful it was to land in Memphis and cross the border in the Mississippi and start driving south. My son said something really interesting to me. And if you just, you know, we used to live in North Carolina. Now we live in California, if you know much about Southern California. And my son said, Dad, I, I, I don't know really how to say this. He said, but there's something really good about seeing roadkill. That's what he said. <laughs>
He said, it tells you there's animals that live around here. Driving through the trees. And my, my son comes by that honestly. His grandfather's a real southern guy who grew up on, on the farm with Mama. You know how that was. And so my son came by a lot of that honestly. Is, so we're happy to be in Mississippi where there's roadkill. That's, that's one thing I can tell you. There's something healthy about that, you know. Something healthy about that. Well, let's get into the Bible. Oh, by the way, by the way, it just occurred to me, when you go by our booth, grab a pile of every word cards. You can just give a card. Hey, have a look at this on the Internet. Maybe I'll talk about this tonight. Witnessing can be really easy. You know that? There's lots of ways to do it, and I'm not telling you this is the only way. But you don't have to go up to a perfect stranger in a supermarket with a Bible and say, can I read you a verse? That's not the only way. You don't have to go to your atheist neighbor with a Bible study. That's not the only way. That's a way. If God moves you to do that, knock yourself out. But sometimes all you need to do is say, everybody's on the internet. Let me just give them a card and say, check this out. That's it. Check this out. This is some encouragement. That's all. So grab those every word cards. You can spread them like the leaves of autumn. We've got bags back there. We don't want to take the stuff home with us. So clean us out. Uh, there's some really good resources there that we'd love for you to have. It's all free. All right. The Word of God is free. Aren't you glad about that? I am glad about that. You know, uh, I had the, the privilege of speaking to an august assembly this morning. Spoke to the pastors and conference workers and conference administrators. Oh, well, conference administrators are workers too. <laughs> I don't want to put them, no, I'll put them in another category here. What's he saying about them? We had the opportunity to talk about how wonderful it is to be able to share the Word of God with people. How wonderful it is. I still believe, and we still believe that it is written, that there is power in the Word of God. There's a whole lot of things that you can do to change your life. I took my kids to a water park. It's one of these water parks where they have these water slides about 17 miles long. There's long as ski runs. Got the slide like this that drops straight down. I like that one, actually. What I noticed when I was at the water park is that I was the odd one out. It seemed like I was the only guy who didn't have a, a life-size tattoo plastered on his back or his chest or up his arms or down his legs. You see, people want to change themselves. So they get this body art. Used to be that sailors came back with mom tattooed on their arm or something like that. Now the bigger and the badder and the more colorful and the uglier, the better it is. People want to change themselves. Piercing everything that can be pierced. People want to change themselves. That's all right. People go through those phases. I want to tell you the one thing that still brings lasting, powerful change that's worth something is the Bible. It'll change you. You take a lump of dough and sit it there on the counter, it's a lump of dough. You take that same lump of dough but put a little yeast in there, put it on the counter. That, that dough is going to rise. It's going to rise. There's going to be a change. And you're going to say, well, man, it just looks like dough. How is it doing that? And you'll know that it's doing that because there's something in it. There's something inside it that's bringing about change. And it's good change. And if you let the Word of God get inside of you, it's going to bring about change that you can be glad about. Now, I say this carefully. I'm a little worried. I don't want you to react negatively. When President Obama was elected the first time as president, he, he campaigned on a policy of change. We need change. Well, you know, that's hard. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that a country always needs change. So he was tapping into something that everybody could relate to. People always want change. That's right. We can campaign on the same platform. We need change. Except we, as God's people, living down here in the close of time, we know that real change doesn't come from Washington, D.C. Real change comes from the Word of God. Can you say amen? amen? Let's plug into the Word of God this morning. Bow your head with me, please. We will pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, 
We thank you, Lord, that we can come to you today in the name of Jesus. In the words of the old song, in our hand no price we bring. Simply to the cross we cling. We come to you today holding on. If you want us, I'm glad you don't, but if you want us to present to you our virtues and our goodness and our righteousness, and we have to confess to you right now that we cannot because we have none. None. But we come to you today presenting not our own goodness, but that of Jesus. We, we claim the merits of his shed blood today. And now, Lord, as we think to open the Bible, I pray be merciful to us. Allow us to hear your voice. There's somebody here who probably ought to stop texting right about now. There's somebody here who probably ought to stop worrying about the argument they had with the spouse on the way here. There's somebody here who ought to stop pouting about what mom or dad just said to them a few moments ago. Some of us, we can't get our minds off our worries. Some of us, we're here, but our minds are not. Make this time yours, please, and I ask that you would be merciful to me. Don't let the brokenness of fallen humanity get in the way of the operation of your Holy Spirit. We thank you today. We are grateful. We pray in Jesus' name. Please say with me, Amen and Amen. Please open your Bible to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. When you turn to the book of Matthew chapter 25, you come to a fascinating chapter. It's a chapter full of well, parables, really. The first parable in Matthew chapter 25 is that of the ten virgins. It is a shocking chapter. It's not shocking only that five of these young women had no oil in their lamps. Sad as that is. It is shocking that the Savior said that all of these young women slumbered and slept. All of them, every one. Now, if it's true that Jesus is talking about his church here, then this ought to be literally a wake-up call to us all. At the same time, it is remarkable that five of them are pictured as being devoid of oil, at least the lamps. They ran out of oil, no more oil supply. There was an oil crisis. Yet Jesus told us in Luke 11 and verse 13, If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father, give me the next word please, will your heavenly Father give the what? The Holy Spirit to them that do what? Ask and you shall receive. The greatest gift that could ever be given to human beings is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And God says He will Give it to you free. It's not something you can buy. It isn't something you can earn. You will never deserve it. God says, I will give it to you. Yet here were five individuals who knew better, who had the opportunity, and they were out of oil. And Jesus is appealing to us to be filled and not empty. Then there's another parable here, and this parable deals with the talents. One individual received five, and one received four, and one received one, and the five invested, and the four, the one with the four invested. But then there was somebody with one talent who took that one talent and hid it in the earth. And when the master came, looking for a return on his investment, he said, why, this is a wicked servant who has done nothing with his talents. I tell you what, God has gifted you. He's gifted you perhaps with the ability to sing. Perhaps with the ability to play. Perhaps with the ability to share or study. Maybe he's given you the ability to finance certain things. Perhaps he's given you influence. Whatever the talent is. 
Certainly, God has given you the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are not to be hidden, but used for His glory. God speaks to every one of us today, and He says there's something you can be doing for me. You've got capacities that you can be serving me with and using as a servant of God down here in the close of time. This parable says that all of us have been called to do something for Jesus, use something for Jesus, invest something for Jesus. And that's not just saying all of us have a responsibility. That's saying, praise the Lord, God can use even me and even you. Would you say amen? God wants to use us. We talked a little bit about that last night. We are the difference that God wants to make in the world. And then we come to this next passage. And I shall read to you from Matthew and chapter 25, verse 31 is where we will begin. And here the Bible says, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory. In essence, all of these parables or passages in Matthew 25 hinge on the second coming, which is spoken of in Matthew 24 so clearly. At the second coming will there be oil in your lamp. At the second coming, will God be able to say to you, yes, you have been active for me. You have used the gifts that I have given you by giving them to me to bless and be used with others. And here, Jesus really brings it home. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, Matthew 25, 31. And all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will say, I'm sorry, and he shall set, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Now, I was raised with sheep and goats. I told you last night that when I was a boy growing up in a country of 3.3 million people, we had 63 million sheep. We were outnumbered. These days, the population of New Zealand is 4 million, and the population of sheep is down to about 43 million. It's dropped a little bit. Still a lot of sheep, and you can hardly be raised in New Zealand without knowing something about sheep. And I mentioned to you last night that we raised sheep, not sheep plural, but sheep singular. At times we had a lamb in our backyard that, that grew into a sheep and then miraculously turned into mutton chops. That's what we had in our yard. We had sheep from time to time. Our neighbor, demonstrating that he was far less civilized than were the Bradshaws, did not keep sheep. Instead, he kept goats. Why? I do not know. I have a dear friend whose wife raises goats. I don't know why. I don't think they're making her a million dollars. I think they smell bad. Not my friend and his wife, but the go goats, goats in general. My friends smell perfectly fine, I'm sure. It's just her thing. She likes goats. She raises them. She sells them. I guess that's okay. Goats have never done much for me, and I'm about to tell you why. We lived on three quarters of an acre, I guess, or something like that when I was growing up. Next to us was a little trucking depot, and a man named Mr. Wop, who uh, delivered coal. He would go to the coal mines and pick up coal and then deliver it to people's homes. He had a couple of trucks that he used and a bunch of old trucks in, his, in the yard. And then a little shack down the back and long grass everywhere. And then was the Roland family and Cess Roland kept goats. Now Cess Roland's backyard was littered with old cars. Of course he was going to salvage them and, and, and refurbish them one day. That's what they all say. And between all these cars was long grass that he could hardly get to to mow. And so that's what the goats did. They kept his long grass down. And when he was out of long grass, he would bring the goats over to Mr. Wop's little trucking depot and let them on a leash, thank the Lord, take down the long grass that grew up around Mr. Wop's trucks. Now the Bradshaws were very active. Five boys in our family, two girls, and the three younger boys, all closer together in age, would often play. We would be playing 
rugby, which involves a ball that one passes or kicks. We wouldn't really bother with soccer. We didn't really think that was fit for boys to be playing. We were rugby players, you understand. We would play tennis. Our aim wasn't always good. We would play cricket. I need to get an amen from my Jamaican brother. All right. Some of you don't know what cricket is. You think, say cricket, and you think, you think we're going fishing, but no. Cricket is a civilized man's game. Played in New Zealand and Great Britain and the West Indies and others of the world's great nations. Occasionally, the ball would be misdirected. So you see what I'm saying is when Mr. Rowland had the goats next door, if the ball got too close to the goats, things could de get delicate. Now, we had sheep covered in wool without anything protruding from their forehead. Mr. Rowland's goats had a couple of weapons that came up out of their head. Sharp horns. And if the ball got too close to the goat, the goat would stop and wait for you to come over. He'd get down low and he'd start aiming his horns right at you. And if you ever were careless enough to bend down, to pick up the ball right by the goat, you presented that goat with an irresistible target. And he had a great aim, unfortunately. Goats, stupid things. Sorry, not your goats. They're the most intelligent creatures God ever placed on the earth. Mr. Rowland's goats were stupid things. Goats will eat anything. You couldn't fool our sheep. It had to be grass or something real good, like grass. Goats will eat the label off a tin can. Goats will eat your straw hat. Goats will eat whatever they can get to eat. Doesn't make a difference to a goat. These goats were stubborn. You couldn't reason with them. Try reasoning with a goat. You are never going to be able to do it. Reason with a sheep, on the other hand, and you will find that sheep are personally, are, are perfectly reasonable creatures, not goats. I was raised with sheep and goats. Sheep will follow you. I don't know goats well enough. I kept my distance after Mr. Rowland's goats got a hold of me a couple of times. I never did hear about a shepherd calling after his goats, having goats follow him. Maybe they do. If they don't and I don't know, then I don't even care to know. They're just goats. And Jesus kind of followed my line of thinking. He said, on the one hand, you've got sheep. And on the other hand, you've got goats. He said that he was the good shepherd. And he said in John chapter 10 that his sheep hear his voice. Here you have sheep on the right hand, goats on the left. And we read in verse 34, Then shall the king say to them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The sheep are the saved, the goats are the lost. You could call the sheep the wheat and the goats the tares. You could call the sheep those who have the seal of God. And the goats, those who have the mark of the beast. There's a dividing line here. Already we see in this story that some will be saved and some will be lost. It's that simple. Now Jesus does something fascinating here. He talks about that which makes the difference between sheep and goats. He talks about a difference that is manifest in their experience. Let's read about this. He says in verse 35, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and ye took me in. Naked and ye clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then shall the righteous answer him. So Jesus says the sheep are the righteous. Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When did we see you a stranger and took you in or naked and clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison and, and, and came to you? 
And the king shall answer and say to them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. That's fascinating. We'll come back to that. We're going to visit this and we're going to look at this a little bit. And then he says to them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed. The goats are the cursed. If you take this over there to the sanctuary service, you see that the sheep, the lamb would represent Jesus. There were times, obviously, that goats were offered too. But on the Day of Atonement, that, that animal that was led out into the wilderness, Azazel, that was a goat. I just see something very fitting in that whole thing. I was hungry and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me, and naked and you clothed me not, sick and in prison and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And then he shall, he shall answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now, I don't know if we preach like this much anymore, but the fact of the matter is, it matters what you do. It matters. The Bible continues to say that sin is the transgression of the law. Some things are right, some things are not. Some things are righteous, and some things are sin. I wonder if society hadn't just got away from that a little bit. And you know that the church is only ever a step or two behind society. A petite woman, an unlikely killer, murders her husband brutally, leaves him in the shower of his apartment dead. He's discovered a couple of days later, just days ago. This one would have thought sweet young woman was pleading with a jury to spare her life. An 18-year-old young woman in Florida has been charged with a crime involving a minor, somebody four years her junior. She sobbed a couple of days ago in front of television cameras saying, I'm scared of losing my life, the rest of my life. It sounds harsh to put it that way or this way, but the time to think about that is before the crime is committed. Because the fact is, one day we will all have to face the things that we have done on this earth. There will be a judgment day one day. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And there are some issues as I look at this. Perhaps one issue is that today people more than ever have a sense of entitlement, a lack of concern about consequences, a lack of understanding or acceptance that there even are consequences. We have that even in the church. And maybe, maybe part of this challenge stems from our understanding or misunderstanding of grace. Is God gracious? Yes or no? My name, John, I like very much in as much as it means God is gracious. I have an assurance of God's grace printed on my birth certificate. I am thankful for that. But you know that people can relate to the grace of God in such a way that it makes them careless. Did you know that? Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Because God doesn't come after you like an angry pit bull every time you step out of line, you can get emboldened in your sin and cease to think that sin is a serious matter. Somehow we've got to know the difference. And what's the difference? Ladies and gentlemen, is the difference what we know? I don't think that's the difference. What we know informs us, and it's important. I guess you could say the difference is what you know, because if you didn't know better, you might not be able to make a better decision. But I would say that for us, the question isn't what do you know? The question is who do you know? The difference is whether or not we have ever met who? Jesus, the what? The gentle shepherd. If you've met him and come to know him, 
This is going to change your life. I will tell you why. Somewhere in the Bible, I read that by beholding, we become changed. I believe that's 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. Can you agree with that? Can you say amen? amen? What you focus on is what you turn into. Isn't that right? We've got, <laughs> we've got people spending millions and millions of dollars on research to find out if kids who play violent video games become violent. What? How many of these kids ever took a gun to school and shot everybody up and said, you know, I was just sitting in the library studying algebra when I thought to myself, hey, that would be good. No, normally it's these poor souls who've been feeding on negativity and death and hate and violence and they just start to play it out in their lives. Now, of course, it's, I don't mean to be simplistic. There are psychological issues and there are societal issues. I'm not trying to be simplistic about it. But I just wish that somebody would save the government a whole bunch of money. They could give me just a few million dollars and I could take them right to 2 Corinthians 3.18 to take me 10 seconds and show them that by beholding, we become changed. If you want to look at negative stuff, you're going to become negative. Let me say this, ladies and gentlemen, in case you think that you are the one who straightens out all the troubles that we've got in Zion. If all you do is focus on the problems in the church, it will be five minutes and you will be a problem in the church. So on the drive back to church after camp meeting, if you say, I heard something, I'm going to go back and straighten them out, hand out some tracts in my church. I'm going to go back there and tell everybody what the conference is doing wrong at camp meeting. Just forget it. You will not be helping. You will be hindering. Don't go there. By beholding, we become changed. Look at the problems, become a problem. Look at the solution, and you become part of the solution. So if it's true that by beholding we become changed, if we know Jesus, the gentle shepherd, isn't it true, just like night follows day, that we will become gentle like Jesus? Doesn't that stand to reason? Sure it does. Look up the meaning of that word, word gentle. That word gentle, it means mild in temperament or behavior, kind or tender. How about that? What if our churches were filled with kind and tender people? It means moderate in action, effect, or degree. Not harsh or severe. Think now. It means amiable. A man I love greatly, deeply respect and admire him. He's a well-known author and teacher and speaker in our church. When asked one day how he wanted to be remembered, he paused and then he thought and, and, and he spoke very thoughtfully. He said, I would like to be remembered for being gentle. He didn't say, I want to be remembered for the books I write or the, or the sermons I produce or the service that I gave to my church. Let them remember that I was gentle. Oh, friend, God calls us today to look to Jesus and be molded and become like Him. I will tell you why. In the end of time, there are two groups, the sheep and the goats. It is inevitable that you will be in one or the other of those two groups. And as somebody who knows the shepherd... God wants us to stand with the sheep, the saved sheep down in the close of time. God wants you to be saved much more than you want to be saved. By the way, He wants your wayward children to be saved more than you do. He wants your neighbors to be saved more than you do. God wants for you to be in that group of the sheep, not in that group of the goats. And what's the Savior like? Let's think about this, because remember... Jesus said to the sheep, I was in prison and you came to visit me. I didn't have any clothing. You helped me out. I was hungry and you filled me up. Here's what I read in a very, very good book, a book I like very, very much, a book called The Ministry of Healing. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. That's what I read. And I read this and I weighed it up and I think it's true. The Savior mingled among men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. Now, you know the mistake that we so often make is we send out our advertising saying, follow me. Without having first got beside people and let them see what it is they might be following without getting beside people, ministering to them and helping them and letting them see Jesus. 
We will let them hear our doctrines. We must let them see our Savior. I was talking with my friend Johnny Mosquera the other day. Yesterday. It can't have been the other day. It was yesterday. And Johnny Mosquera and I, we were talking about evangelism and what we're seeing and, and, and trends and so forth. And Johnny was saying, more and more and more, we are seeing that the people who are one to the message in our evangelistic work are people who have been developing relationships with church members along the way. It was always supposed to be like that. Get to know them. Get to love them. Get them to love you. Love the church. Love the truth. Get them to know you care. Let them see that you want to make a difference in their life. Let them see that you are beside them even in their struggles and in their concerns, you see. And when they see that, following your Savior isn't going to be nearly so hard because they have seen the difference the Savior has made in your life. The sheep have seen that. Jesus said to us through the uh, prophet Isaiah, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? Earlier in that chapter, he said, you, you fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness, Isaiah 58. And then he said, the fast that I have chosen for you is to undo the heavy burdens, break every yoke. He wants us to let the oppressed go free. When you see the poor that are cast out, bring them to your house. This is simply the, 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 pro the prophecy that sets up what Jesus says about the sheep in Matthew chapter 25. God has called us to make a difference, a gentle difference, a difference that matters. It doesn't matter in the big picture how much you know about the Bible. If the Bible hasn't transformed you into the sort of person that a person can look at and say, now that's a Christian. That's true. Whether you believe it or not, it's true. God wants us to come to Him, kneel before the cross, be broken and let him remake us after the similitude of his divine character. That's what he wants us to do. Gone must be the days when we think we're going to argue people into the kingdom of heaven. Nobody ever got baptized and gave a testimony by saying, the reason I'm getting baptized today is because I lost the argument. Nobody ever said that. But time and again they say, I was loved into the church. I met people who cared about me. Although I tell you this, I had a fellow in, in Kentucky who told me one day, he said, you know, I joined the church and the people did not love me. They didn't even seem to care about me. So rather than leave, I decided I'm going to make them love me. And he did. He became one of the most loved guys in the church. This man is a one in a million. Most people don't do that. Most would just walk away discouraged that nobody cared. My friend, we got to go after people just like God went after people. Sheep who have learned from and become like the gentle shepherd. Does God come after people? Yes, He does. He doesn't come after the lost to do them in, but to get them in. I want you to think about the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son went to the dad and he said, Dad, I want my share. Now the oldest son would have got a double portion of the dad's estate. So this fellow left town with a third of his father's wealth. And if his father had a substantial holding, he would have left town with bulging pockets. And he went to a far country and he lived like a fool and he wasted it all. And he had nothing to show for it. And he ended up friendless and penniless, feeding pigs. The only way he could survive was by eating the pig food. What a disgrace for a Jewish boy. He came to himself. He said, I'll go home and I'll tell dad I'll be a slave. That's what I'll do. I'll explain to my father how sorry I am. But dad, if you'd let me be one of your hired servants, that'll be okay. One of your slaves, that'll be all right. He started the walk of shame. I don't know how many miles he went, but he had gone into a far country. He started walking home. Dad had to be out in the fields because he looked up and even though the son was dressed in rags now, even though he was uh, uh, certainly emaciated now, Somehow the dad saw the son. And what did he do? He ran towards him. Now, put yourself in the position of the prodigal son. You're coming home. You're embarrassed. You know that your family has heard what a fool you've been. You have disgraced your father's name. And you look up the road, and here's your father running towards you. And you think to yourself, this is going to work out very badly. 
Undoubtedly he will yell. Perhaps he will beat me. He will certainly turn me around and send me back in the direction from which I came. But miracle of miracles, the dad doesn't act like that. He throws himself at his boy to hug him. He kisses him. He brings him home arm in arm and he says, kill the fatted calf, bring the best robe, put on the signet ring, which signified the boy had authority in the family. This, my son, was dead and now he is alive. He was lost and he has been found. Now stop and think. The boy just can't believe. This is how my dad treats me. You know that his heart and his father's heart are so bound together now they'll never separate. But think about the dad. Who was it the dad saw walking down the road towards him? He saw his, his what kind of son? His prodigal son. What did he know about his son's lifestyle at that point? Evidently he knew something because he was able to say my son had been dead. So all the dad knew was that here was his son. His lost son. His fool-headed son. Did the father know why the boy was back? He did not. For all the father knew, the boy could have been back to say, Oh man, I need more money. Dad did not know. I want you to notice that the father did not go out there and say, So why are you here? Oh, I'm back because I'm repentant. Beautiful! Come on now, kill the fatted calf. I'm back because... Well, I'm actually not back. I'm actually passing through. There's a party down the road a little further. Well, just keep on going. Not even knowing why the boy was back. The father was thrilled to see him. And he ran to him and he hugged him and he said, Man, my home is your home. Hmm? I wonder what would happen in our churches. Now, let's first talk about our families. I wonder what would happen in our families if when our children messed up their lives, we ran towards them, and when we got to them, we threw our arms around them. Can you imagine that? I'm not advocating a lack of discipline. Smash. Oh, what was that? I just threw my baseball through the kitchen window again. Oh, my boy, I'm so glad. Now, that might not work. Someone's going to put you away for a while if that's how you react in all of those situations. But imagine your estranged kid who hadn't been in church in 20 years. Instead of when the kid came home, you giving him or her a lecture about how they go into hell because they don't keep the Sabbath. Imagine if you just hugged them and loved them and cooked the best you had and treated them like royalty. Imagine that. I'm not advocating that. I'm not trying to tell you how to run your family. I'm not, I'm not doing that. But that's what God does. You, sh you get to within shouting distance of God. And I guess you always are. He's ready to embrace you. You know the father who ran and that story represents God. And as far as I can tell, that's the only time the Bible ever portrays God as running. And why is he running? He's running towards a sinner. Not to chase him off, but to welcome him back and tell him how glad he is to see him. That's what gets God moving. Sinners coming on back Sniffing around, wonder if they'll be accepted. Now I want to make a point here. Do we see a contrast between God's approach and our approach? Imagine in our churches if somebody came around church who hadn't been in a while and they knew that they would be loved. If we loved the fallen, did our best to help them up rather than help them out. How about if when someone came to church stinking of alcohol, instead of the deacons huddling in the back, going, oh, Larry over there, he's been on the booze again. If they ran to Larry and hugged him and shook his hand and said, Larry, come to my house for lunch after church, and you had drunk Larry sitting at your table, you ought to be honored because that's what Jesus would do. What if there was somebody who had a bad reputation, and when they came to church, instead of shunning them and treating them like a leper, you went to that person and said, come to my place. Oh, no, she's coming to my house. No, they're coming to my house. What a difference it would make. What if somebody who was famously immoral, somebody had been released from prison, and their first thought was, i got to get to the church because they will love me there. What a difference it would make. I'm making a point here, and it's more than just a point. It's what Jesus did 
a woman was taken in adultery. She was not accused. She was found guilty in the act. They dragged her to Jesus, and Jesus' words were, I do not condemn you. Now, he certainly added, go and sin no more. Let's not forget that. But Jesus didn't condemn her. No censure, no accusation. There was love. A man named Zacchaeus, he was a thief. He was a rip-off merchant. Tax, he collected taxes for the Roman government, which made him a turncoat at best. And then he would say, two for them and one for me. Two for them and one for me. He would take more than he should, and he enriched himself that way. This man was dishonest. He was a thief. And Jesus went to his house. And you read in Luke 19 that Zacchaeus said, Well, I'm a changed man now. I will give back what I have ripped off. I'm going in a different direction. But what you don't read about in Luke 19 is Jesus' sermon. You read the Sermon on the Mount, but you don't read the sermon at Zacchaeus' house. We aren't told that Jesus lectured Zacchaeus. We're not told that he pulled him aside and said, Hey, buddy, this, this theft business, it really got to quit, right? We're not told any of that. We are told that Jesus went to his house. He demonstrated hospitality, kindness, love. The Holy Spirit got through to the man. Zacchaeus was changed by the love of God. Friend, when you know the gentle shepherd I'll tell you what he does. He makes you into that kind of person. I'm a little concerned. I've probably been guilty of this myself. Our churches are full of people who can explain 27 fundamental beliefs. Who can tell you about the pillars. But they're meaner than sin. And haven't been converted. You see, Jesus is the good shepherd. We talked about that last night. Jesus is the gentle shepherd. And as we look to Jesus, we're going to be like him. Now, I understand. I understand growth. I understand that. We're all growing. I understand mistakes being made. I understand that. But what I don't understand is when the head deacon blows up again in a board meeting and people just kind of shrug their shoulders and say, well, that's just old Bill. Well, old Bill needs to meet old Jesus because it's obvious that he hasn't. And old Bill, before he carries on in that job, ought to get him a new heart because he's making a mockery of the grace of God. I'm not talking about the occasional mistake when this is the habitual pattern of your life, when people just know that you've got a hard edge that needs to be sanded away. God wants us to become like Jesus because it's those kind of people who are described in the Bible as the sheep. They care. They care care they care about god and they care about others you know that paul wrote to the romans in romans 6 and verse 16 and he said don't you know that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey his servants you are to whom you obey whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness i guess the question is who are you serving today the thing is we get to choose and i want to speak to you because somebody is sitting here saying yep that's me. no hang on some wife is sitting here saying, yep, that's him. And he's sitting there saying, yeah, I know people like that. I know people like that. And late on today when she kindly says, honey, don't you know that you're like that? He's going to say, that's just how I am. I don't think I can change. I was born that way. You might have been born that way. I believe people are born that way, born with dispositions and predispositions, born with inherited tendencies towards evil. I believe they're born that way, but I believe what Jesus said, that people can be born again. Can you say amen? People can be born again. So I'm not here to tell you how bad you are. I'm here to tell you how good Jesus is. And I'm here to guarantee you that if you look to Jesus, he will make you like himself. That's what he does. The only thing stopping you from being like Jesus is an unwillingness to be like Jesus. Otherwise, he will make you like himself. He simply will. Now, you can tell people all about Babylon and, and, and tell people that they got to come out of Babylon. But if Babylon hasn't come out of you, we probably call that hypocrisy. Probably. 
And if you look in the Bible, Jesus uses that word hypocrite and the root word, the Greek word for hip, hip, the word hypocrite in the Greek means actor. Isn't that something? So we've got some folks in church who ought to be given an Academy Award because they've been acting like Christians for decades now. Had everybody fooled. God wants better for you than that. I'm not saying better from you, better for you. Because you know what you read in the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. Let's bring this home and find out just how wonderfully workable this is. The Bible says in Philippians 2 and verse 13, It is God who works in you, both to will and to do, for His good pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, if we just let God work in our lives, He will do a work in your life that will amaze you and others besides. That's the work He wants to do. Come on now. God wants to straighten you up. God wants to stiffen your spiritual backbone. God wants to, to, to turn you into a witness with a contagious faith. God wants to reach people through you. God wants to give you a smile when times are tough. God wants you to be positive when things are down. You can't do that, but God can do that in you. We've got a message to share. The message is going to change the world. But first, the message and the person of the gentle shepherd needs to change us. Sheep and the goats. You are one or the other now, and you will be one or the other then. God knows none of us need to be goats on that final day. If you are lost right now, you don't need to be lost. If you've got a hard edge right now, I'll be the first to run towards you and hug you and tell you that Jesus can take care of that hard edge. If you find yourself being drawn to websites that you know you shouldn't be visiting and you can't keep away from, oh, pastor, you don't know how hard it is. I might not know how hard it is, but I know how tough Jesus is. And he can take that from you and make you a new person. Now, in a moment, with a decision from you to allow him to do so. This Christianity business works, man. It works. You thought Christianity was just learning what we believe as a church. Oh, come on. That's just the beginning. God wants to take you deeper with Him, further with Him, because one day He wants to take you high with Him. You might have got high before once or twice in your life. I'm going to tell you, one day you're really going to get high. Jesus is going to lift you up. Gravity is going to lose power over the soles of your feet. You're going to go up so high, you're going to say, this is the best drug anybody could take. And maybe I'm out of line. We're here in a Christian place. You all don't know anything about that, but you know, we've got a message to share and a message to believe and live. It will change you. Well, I tried to get over my bad temper. All right? You need to quit trying. I prayed about my bad. Now, don't quit praying. You can quit praying. You can keep on praying. But what are you praying? What are you praying? God, help me to keep my temper? Oh, that's a, that ain't happening. God, help me not to blow my cool or help me to keep my thoughts straight. That ain't going to happen. What a dumb prayer. Don't pray that prayer. Don't be asking God to help you to be strong enough to fight off temptation. Didn't you ever read in the Bible that God's strength is made perfect in weakness? you weak. Tell God how weak you are and tell Him that the only thing that's going to keep you straight is if Jesus comes and lives His life in you. That's all that's going to do it. You don't need the power of you. You need the power of Christ. And that's what God wants to give you now. It's a saving power. It is a transforming power. It is a revolutionary power. Suddenly, you'll be tempted, and man, I don't know what happened there, but my thoughts were on Jesus, and he kept the promise made to me in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. And there was a way of escape, and I was out of a jam before I knew I was in a jam. Thank you, Jesus, and this will become the habit of your life. God has promised to keep you from falling. God has promised promised that he'll straighten you out god has promised that he will give you strength god has promised that if anyone is in christ that person is a new creature old things are what tell me passed away behold how many things are made new 
all things are made new. Somebody say praise the Lord. That's what God can do for us. One day Enoch and God went for a walk together. And they were just enjoying each other's company so much. Now one day God said, well, you know, Enoch, we're closer to my house now than we are to yours. Let's keep on going to my house. Walk with God. You can walk with God today. Yes, you can. Oh, I have struggles. Yes, you do. We all do, man. But Jesus is greater than the greatest struggle. I have my weaknesses. I told you already, his strength is made perfect in weakness. I have found that if I drink the right amount of glasses of water a day and eat the right amount of almonds a day and if I drink soy milk and if I get a little exercise right amount of sun get some fresh air that at the end of the day I'm still a sinner I'm not against any of that I eat almonds man good things I drink soy milk I don't drink that milk that comes out of a cow I don't like it I drink soy milk I try and drink a lot of water. I mean, look how holy I am. I have four bottles of water here. But I know that the right amount of water is going to be good for my body and therefore good for my mind. I'm not, I'm not knocking the health message. I, I, I'm, I'm lifting it up. I believe in the health message. The health message isn't an end. It's a means to an end. You understand? is to clean us up so that Jesus can really get a hold of our mind. I have found that I can do all the right things and check all the right boxes. But at the end of the day, if I don't have Jesus, I don't have anything at all. I can have a healthy heart, but it might be a healthy old heart. When God wants me to have a healthy new heart. I've known scoundrels that God has used to save souls former scoundrels and I know scoundrels that God has saved just last year I baptized a witch doctor a real one not a pretend one a real Papua New Guinean witch doctor who practiced black magic I don't have time to tell you about what he used to do incredible stuff and God is using that man now for his glory I have a friend who is a pastor uh, he was a friend of mine and I was worried about him raised in an Adventist family Raised in a good Christian home, this friend of mine. And he broke his dad's heart because he got to the stage that he would like to drink. And not only drink, but he used to like to fight. I remember sitting in his home with him. And I've been in my share of fights too. You know, one thing that I never could get past was the pain. I, I, I didn't like that. He said, John, I would go out to a pub, a bar, and I'd look around and find the biggest guy there. And then I'd pick a fight with him. And I'd beat him. I never lose. He was a he was he was, I mean he's a lovely guy. <laughs> he used to beat people up for fun. Now he is one of the most outstanding pastors in his conference, baptizing souls, winning souls. He has a lovely wife and beautiful children because God got hold of his life. I know former problem gamblers who teach the Sabbath school lesson and former drunks who sit on church boards and former liars who lead pathfinders, drug users who turn into Bible workers. If God did it for them. He wants to do it for you. I'm not telling you that you're a drug user or a liar or anything like that. What I'm here today, friends, to tell you is that there is a gentle shepherd, Jesus. And he wants to make us like him. So that his message in our lives, through our lives, is a message that has great, great power. Now, I want, to, I want you to listen to this. I've made a bit of a habit of sharing these next few words where I've traveled and spoken. If you are familiar with them, I'm hoping that you will appreciate them. Listen to these words. They're from uh, one of the most powerful books I've ever read. It's called The Desire of Ages. And I want you to listen to this. This little passage starts off by saying, if we consent. Now, what were those three words I just said? Now, can you give me another word that means consent? Permission, allow, anything else? Agree, allow, one more? Submit, that's a good one. Okay, so if we consent, agree, give permission, allow, submit,
if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims. So blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will. That when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Now, I know the reason that you didn't get up on your chair and shout and say hallelujah is because you're just thinking about it. Because that would not be, and well, you don't have to stand on your chair. You could fall off and hurt somebody. But that would otherwise be not an inappropriate reaction. If we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. You'll be doing what's coming naturally. It didn't say if you, if you pray till the cows come home. It didn't say if, if, you, if you get yourself straightened out. It simply says if you allow him, he will do that in you. This is phenomenal. If you let him, the will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. Highest delight? Man, I reserve that for Alabama games. That's my highest delight. Highest delight? You haven't eaten my wife's pumpkin pie. That's my highest delight. Hold on a minute. Your highest delight will be in doing God's service. Not, oh man, do I need to go witness to, should I? Oh, I guess I should say something to that lady about Jesus. No, I want to be in the service of God. That's what really fires me up. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing His service. Listen to this now. When we know God, as it is our privilege to know Him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Oh, man. Again, it didn't say if you just try hard enough. It says when you know Him, as it's your privilege to know Him. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ. I like that. Through communion with God. Sin will become hateful to us. Now that's the message of the Bible, but that message is so beautifully put together in this statement that I wanted to share it with you. And it begins with consent. If you will allow, if you will permit, if you just let God be God. It is God who works in you, both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Not I, but Christ lives in me. That's the message of the Bible. Friend, where are you going to be? Sheep or goats? Well, if I was only good enough. No! If I could only get over. No! If Jesus would just take my life, He will. He'll take it if you give it to Him. What are you waiting for today? Our privilege as Christians is a greater privilege than we might know. I think... I think that um, we might not even know what we've got here. We might not know how powerful this can be. We might not know the depths of what God can do in our lives. Let me conclude by telling you this brief story, true story. Just a few months ago, it was winter time. In the city of Evanston, Wyoming, and Evanston is in the southwest corner of Wyoming, some kids playing on their sleds found a man dead under an overpass, a railway overpass. He had died of hypothermia. He was homeless, broke, had few if any friends, few if any worldly possessions, and no money. He died penniless and alone. But here's what he didn't know. Timothy Gray, his name is Timothy Gray. Here's what he didn't know. His aunt in New York City had recently died before he died. She left over $300 million in her will. $19 million of it was left to 60-year-old Timothy. And he didn't know. If he had known, he wouldn't have to have been homeless he could have bought the 50 most expensive homes in Evanston, Wyoming and still had plenty of money left over. He could have bought the fanciest hotel in town and still had money left over. 
hungry, he would never have to rifle through another trash can as long as he lived. He could have bought every food item on every food store shelf in town and had tons of money left. He died homeless and broke when he was worth millions. That's how so many people are today, friend. They live spiritually struggling. They live spiritually struggling, spiritually bankrupt, emotionally miserable, unaware that they are wealthy in the sight of God, unaware that they are not homeless, but they have a home in heaven and a home always in God's heart. Unaware that through the power of God, through faith, through simple consent, they can be victorious Christians. Should they stumble, they know that God will not let go of their hand. Should they stumble, they understand something about growing in the grace of God. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. God is being patient with me. There are people today in this church probably in this place who don't know yet from experience how free and how wealthy they are because when Jesus died he left in his will more than 19 million little dollars he left the inexhaustible riches of the Holy Spirit the gold of his character he left for you friend Will you claim it today? I'm going to ask that our singers come forward. I think you're going to lead us in a closing song, which is a beautiful closing song. But I see looking over there a baptistry. I don't know if there's any water in it. There's, that certainly can be remedied. And obviously the plan is that there'll be water in there one day. Ginger, would you mind playing kind of slowly a little bit as we begin here? And uh, you'll, know when to, you'll know when to step in. But I need, to, I need to speak to you here today. I don't know. Maybe everything is okay with you. Maybe there are no burdens. Maybe there's no problems. No, maybe there's no spiritual lack today. But I want to speak because I believe that in a room this size with as many people as we have today, there's somebody who knows that he or she must make a decision for Jesus now. We're going to stand for our closing song. So if you're able to, would you stand? We're not going to begin just yet. The piano will play and I will speak just a little more, but I would like for you to stand. This song we're about to sing is one of the most beautiful songs you'll find in the hymnal. He leadeth me. By His own hand, He leads me. It's His strength that's going to get me home. It's His grace that's going to guide me through the troubled waters of this world and safely over onto the other shore. Friend, how is it with you? Understand that when I asked you to stand, I didn't ask you to leave. Just stand. As we sing this song today, I want you to ask in your heart if everything's okay between you and Jesus. If it is, thank God. Stand and sing and pray. But if it isn't, if you need to make a decision for Jesus today, I'm going to ask you to make that decision right now by walking down here to the front and meeting with me here. You'll be met by a couple of other pastors. One or two of them will come down here and, and greet you with me. Perhaps it's time for you to make a decision to be baptized. And I don't mean today. But if your decision is to be baptized today, then okay, we'll talk about that. But maybe you need to make a decision to be baptized. How can you hold God off when today He is calling you? Perhaps you've never made a decision to fully commit to Jesus and obey Him and keep the seventh day Sabbath or all of the commandments. And today you're saying, I know what God wants and I know what He can do in my life. I want to make that decision. Maybe you have wandered far from God. You've accepted an invitation to be at camp meeting this year. And you know that your life isn't what it ought to be, but you can't wait any longer. Bring yourself to Jesus today. If you've never fully yielded to Jesus, I invite you to come. Our song leaders will sing. I will patiently wait. Jesus bids you come to Him today. Don't keep Him waiting. The Father runs to you with His arms outstretched. Embrace Him today as we sing. I invite you to come.
Jesús. 